to Facebook Friday. Uh, my name is Kate Wakelin and I am from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia and every Friday um, I, with the magic of internet, um, which hopefully is working, beam into your homes to give an update about a topic of the week related to um, living with neuroendocrine cancer. So it is Friday the 11th of June um, and before I go any further I just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I am broadcasting to you from, the land of the, um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and just taking this moment to respect Elders past, present and emerging and any Indigenous people who are joining us for our broadcast today. One of the things I know, you know, <laughs> I love about living on this very um, precious land is the Yarra River nearby, which in the Woiwurrung language is called the Birrung. Um, this morning I did manage to get out for a walk um, along the Yarra and I might actually post a photo up in our Facebook group later on of the um, fantastic Melbourne fog. It is been very foggy and wet in Melbourne. If you're down in the southern states, you'll probably relate to that. Um, also, if you're in Melbourne, you'll be relating to the, um, well, I guess it's a slight sense of eased lockdown, but still lots of restrictions related to COVID-19. Um, I was very grateful to have received my second vaccine for COVID. Um, so I'm feeling a little bit more relaxed about being able to go to places like supermarkets and shops. But uh, I guess this is an encouragement for everybody. We know that the advice for people with cancer is has been very strong all along and it continues to be so that the, the risks of a COVID vaccine are far, far less than the risks for you of contracting COVID. So um, obviously talk with your doctor about that, but the advice is consistent. The, the risks of vaccines are very, very low. The risks of COVID for people with cancer are very, very high. Um, so uh, just my little reminder to you all. Um, so today I am going to talk about stomas. Now this is a topic that we've, I've kind of threatened to talk about for a while. Um, and there's other, always been other things that um, have kind of um, um, muscled in for a spot on Facebook Friday but today seemed like a really good opportunity to talk about that because I think it's something that lots of people don't really understand and the thing that I know about um, things that are hard to understand is that sometimes that makes them more scary and actually there's some things about stomas that are pretty confronting and scary even when you do understand so I wanted to just do a bit of demystifying if I can and point out some of the resources and things that um, if you find yourself in the position where you're considering, you know, that you've been told that you need to have a stoma or you've got a stoma and you're struggling with it, um, some, some ideas and strategies for how we can help you manage that. So I can see some people have joined us, so that's reassuring to know that my internet's been working. I know that, you know, across Melbourne there's been lots of power outages and, and all sorts of really interesting shenanigans. So, um, uh, and it's actually not only Melbourne who's had terrible flooding, like I'm th all throughout um, Eastern Victoria, uh, sorry, beg your pardon. Yes, Eastern, getting my directions mixed up. Eastern Victoria has been um, inundated as well. So anyway, on with the topic. So I wanted to talk about what is a stoma because it's a word, it's actually a Greek word um, and it actually means mouth. So that's an interesting kind of thought because most of us, when we think about stomas, if we know a little bit, the thought of that being a mouth is an interesting concept, but I guess a mouth being an opening in the body. And a stoma is an opening that's made in the body with an operation, a surgical procedure, and it's either to allow something to come into the body that needs to come in or something to come out of the body that needs to come out. Um, a lot of people immediately leak to the idea of bowel stomas, and we'll certainly talk about those in a minute. But I did want to give some examples of some of the other stomas that um, but, that you might have actually heard of and not really realised that they were they were stomas as well. So, you know, one of the, the key ones that people often do know about is a tracheostomy. So if, um, you know, I used to work many, many years ago, I used to work in road trauma. Um, I, I once I, I yeah it didn't last very long it wasn't it wasn't a great career move for for um Kate who's a bit squeamish but anyway that's another story um uh but often people would come into the ward and they would have really nasty facial injuries and head injuries and um not for for that reason it would be very difficult to breathe through their nose and their mouth and so what they would do is they'd put an artificial opening in that person's neck called a tracheostomy and that would allow the air 
to travel in and out of the lungs and often there would be a breathing tube in there but sometimes if someone's had a like a head and neck cancer they might actually have a long-term tracheostomy that they manage um, on an ongoing basis you know so you people with tracheostomies can get out there and live in the community um, with some significant challenges but that's certainly something that can happen um, neuroendocrine tumors in the head and neck region are really pretty rare um, but sometimes people with paragangliomas can get tumors growing in their carotid body um, and sometimes that can mean like we often try to take those tumours out or treat them with radiation but sometimes if those tumours get big that can cause difficulty breathing. So we have had a few, I've had a few net patients who have actually had a tracheostomy so it's important that we talk about these things just because they're uncommon. Actually when they're uncommon I think it's even more important to talk about it because hopefully if there is a person in the future who's facing that possibility they might come across this video down the track and find it useful to, to know what it's all about. Um, so there's also um, a, a, a different type of stoma, stoma, stoma <laughs> called a PEG, which stands for, and I had to write it down, so just I'm looking at my notes, percutaneous endoscopic gastronomy. And that just like the medical profession just loves a big word, don't they? Like these words are almost impossible to... Um, pronounce but but what it essentially means gastronomy is in gastro you might know is your stomach so this is a tube or a, a, an opening and it, it has a tube because of the type of organ it's going into um, that goes into the stomach and that's usually for the purposes of feeding so if someone isn't able to eat and drink via their mouth for some reason and it might be that there is a bulky tumor in the way it might be that they are having um, sometimes we put in a temporary peg if someone's having really intense radiotherapy to their head and neck region and it's going to be too sore to eat and drink for a while um, sometimes if someone has really really high energy needs and they just can't get enough food in they might have a peg tube and that's a tube that goes straight into the stomach and that's for the purposes of feeding so again this is you know air coming in food coming in it's not always about products coming out of the body that these stomas are related to we can also get what's called a urostomy and if you know your latin or your greek ur might sound a bit like urine and it's a so a urostomy is a um an op artificial opening that goes into the bladder um and that uh we attach a bag on the outside of the body and that collects someone's urine so if for some reason the lower end of your plumbing system isn't going to be functional because you've had cancer or something else some big injury in that area um, then a urostomy might be the way to go you can actually also have a nephrostomy which is a nef means kidney so a, a nephrostomy is way up further in the urinary system and that's a um, an artificial opening and a tube that goes straight into the kidney so you can put like doctors think of tubes and openings to make in all sorts of bodies places and thank heavens they do because they do help us stay alive and and function as 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 well as we can as human beings so but the ones that people often talk about and especially related to nets because nets are often in our gastrointestinal system so i'm going to talk a bit about bowel, st bowel stomas and i want to talk about Quite a bit with you now but before i do i just wanted to give you and look i might live to regret this but i did want to give you a, a bit of a practical demonstration of what a stoma is like now if you're eating your lunch don't panic i promise i'm not going to show you any gory pictures because you know there's enough gory pictures in our lives but i did try, i was just sort of saying to my teenage daughter who's very crafty i said how can I, and because she's a nurse's daughter, she knows what a stoma is. And I said to my daughter, how can I actually do a demonstration of what a stoma actually is? And she's like, well, and she was rifling through the recycling bin and, and we came up with this. So as I said, I might live to regret it. So if you just have to imagine, this is the packet from my salmon from last night's dinner. Um, it was really yummy and and um, I have washed this. So, um, so again don't worry um, but but you can see here you have just have to pretend that this is someone's abdomen so this is someone's tummy and normally there wouldn't be a hole in it clearly you know so if it's sitting on someone's tummy you can't see my tummy I'm not going to show you but um, obviously if that's their skin there's no hole in it and so a stoma is an artificial opening through to an organ so 
I'm just also going to show you my other prop, which is my own very dearly beloved stripy socks. I love a stripy sock. And you can imagine the bowel is like a long tube, which you can think about it a bit like a sock. So, um, you know, I don't probably don't need to demonstrate this this far, but, but you can imagine the bowel being like a sock. And it's in these beautiful, lovely, loose folds in the body. And when, when that's a continuous sock from head to, to, to tail, we don't have a problem. But sometimes we can get tumours growing somewhere along the way of that sock and we've got to um, take that tumour away. Now what ideally they do is, you know, if that's a tumour, they'll cut here and they'll cut here and they'll reconnect, reconnect up. This is, this is not working well, is it? But anyway, they'll reconnect it up and that's called and an anastomosis, that join part between the two ends. And obviously they want that to be a continuous um, sort of channel, which this is clearly not, but thank heavens we're not really made of socks. Um, but sometimes they can't join it up and that might be that um, the tumor is too far down. So sometimes people, um, when the tumor is in the rectum, which is at the very bottom end, right close to um, the opening. Um, and so sometimes, it's not possible to do a reconnection up at that point. Sometimes if the tumour is very involved, um, again, once again, they can't, or the piece of bowel on either side is just so damaged, sometimes they can't do um, a, an anastomosis. Sometimes they need to create a stoma that's actually just temporary. So sometimes it's just about bringing, the, bringing that opening of the bowel to the surface for maybe three or six months to allow things to heal where they've taken the tumour out and then they can actually go back in another operation and do a reversal so connect those two ends of bowel back up again and create an anastomosis and close the stoma off so anyway I'm going a bit delving a bit further than I was planning to at this point in time I'm going to come back to my salmon box and we've got to again pretend that this is um, uh, your tummy and um, I'm in reverse mode so my hands always going to go in the wrong direction so what I'm going to do is pretend that I've got a cut section of bowel where they've taken a tumour out and instead of being able to create an astomosis they have to create a stomach so what they do is they cut a hole <laughs> this is terrible um, they cut a hole in the surface of the tummy and they put the end of the bowel that's been cut that's connected to your healthy end of your digestive system so um, and they and they bring it out to the surface of the tummy and they stitch it around the edge so you get this um, circle of bowel sitting out on the surface of the tummy and right through the middle is straight into the bowel and what that means is that instead of you um, visiting the toilet and sitting on the toilet and using your bowels in the normal way the, the, the fecal material, the poo, will come out of that hole instead. So um, Someone's just said the Queen's mother had a stoma. I did not know that. That's really interesting. You know, one of the things about stomas is that lots of people have them and you'd never know because um, they don't, it's, you know, like you don't, well, actually, in our, in our neuroendocrine cancer support group, we talk about poo a lot, but in general polite conversation, if you're the Queen's mother, you probably don't talk about your toilet habits that much. So, you know, lots of people have stomas and you would never know. So um, it just pays to never assume things about people, doesn't it? Um, but obviously with a stoma that's come from the bowel, you don't, have, you don't have a muscle at the end. There's no muscle, there's no sphincter, there's no, oh, I get a, I've got a signal from my body, I need to go and sit on the toilet and, you know, use the toilet in the normal way. We've got contents of that sock, that bowel, that will be coming through whenever it kind of feels like it. And if you've got carcinoid syndrome, that could be quite frequently. So obviously we can't have that just sort of dangling in the breeze, otherwise we would have big mess. So what we do is we fit a bag over the top of that opening. And that's, you know, there's lots of different types of bags depending on the type of stoma. I, this, I should say this is a lot bigger than a normal stoma. Um, but I, I just, it was the whole I cut and the sock was big and you'll have to forgive me, I'm a nurse, not a kindergarten teacher. So anyway, I don't know if that's even helpful to see the physical demonstration, but sometimes if you've got a brain like mine, that's really visual and sometimes it can be helpful. So, so as I said, if it's a stoma that's over um, a part of the body or, or connecting to a part of the body where we're wanting to accommodate 
things that need to come out so either urine or bowel contents um, then we need to put a bag or a collection device on the outside so we'll talk about that um, so with bowel stomas there are various points along the bowel the bowel is a massive long tube and there's various points along that bowel that we might put need to put a stoma so obviously they'll put it well no maybe not obviously but usually they'll try and put it as far down along the length of the bowel as they can to allow as much as possible of normal bowel to do the job the bowel has to do so you know up in the small bowel that's jo the job of that small bowel is to absorb lots and lots of nutrients and also to be um, sitting with the digestive enzymes that are squirted through from your liver and your bowel, your gallbladder um, and your pancreas. So um, uh, we, we don't want to cut out, we don't want to sort of divert the bowel any, any earlier than we have to because of the longer that food gets to sit along the length of that bowel, the better your digestion is going to be, the better the absorption of your vitamins and your minerals and your fluids will be. So in the small bowel it's all around um, absorption of nutrients. In the large bowel it's it's largely around the absorption of fluid. So in the small bowel it's real what's in there is really really liquid and um, and you know that because if you get diarrhea it's rushing through really fast so it hasn't had a chance to be absorbed the liquid hasn't been had a, had a chance to be absorbed by the large bowel and you're getting but very much more like small bowel contents um, so if you've got a stoma up the top end of the small bowel that's called an ileostomy because it's connecting to the ileum um, usually and so the contents that will come out of that stoma opening will be quite liquid sort of more like soup than um, than what you would be usually well maybe if you've got carcinoid syndrome it might not be that different but often um, quite a lot more liquidy than what you would see in the toilet if you've got a colostomy you can imagine that goes into the colon so the col is related to the colon so it's a larger bowel stoma and if that's sort of further down towards the bottom end the contents of what's coming out of that opening will be much more usually much more firm but you can still get diarrhea through a stoma right so um so sometimes you know it doesn't matter where along the length of the bowel is and especially if you get carcinoid syndrome you might have very liquid bowel motions regardless so the same things that we might suggest for the management of diarrhea when you don't have a stoma really do apply because um we don't as i said we don't have a sphincter we don't have any control at all and look sometimes with diarrhea we lose control but at least we usually get a bit of a warning whereas with a stroma um, that might put out quite a lot of contents quite quickly um, and sometimes that can um, really stretch the friendship with the capacity of the bag that we've got on the surface of the skin to collect this so that can be really really practical um, a really really are practically difficult um, and you know most people with stomas learn very quickly that putting a mattress protector on the bed a waterproof mat mattress protector is going to be really vital to um, to your well-being and and um, so because sometimes they can the bags can leak so there's lots of things we can sort of suggest around getting a bag not to leak but if you've got a big whoosh of contents coming out all at once then you can have um, a problem Houston so um, so yeah so we can have ileostomies we can have colostomies um, sometimes they're temporary um, sometimes they're permanent so I'm just looking at my notes and working out if they've sort of ticked everything off that I was going to mention in this section I did want to talk about the practical aspects of living with a stroma and then I'm going to talk a bit about diet and then I'm going to talk a little bit a bit more about the emotional aspects of living with a stroma so um, one of the things about um, contents of the body coming out in a place where they're not really designed to come out is that the, the skin, the, the area around that opening is not really designed to cope with the type of matter that that is. So if it's, for example, if, it, if you've got an ileostomy particularly, but if also a colostomy, the, the acidity slash alkalinity of what's coming out of that opening is really uh, it's actually very very alkaline so if you can imagine your stomach is really acidic in the small bowel we actually the the job part of the job of the small bowel is to make the contents more alkaline so that by the time they get to the bottom end it's not going to burn your skin in either direction because you can be burnt by either acid or alkaline so um 
uh, if you've got an ileostomy or a colostomy where you're getting a lot of you know quite liquid contents the the poo can actually really play havoc with your skin and so the fit of that bag and that's part of the reason well if you go back to my really really inelegant cumbersome piece of kindergarten craft you notice that I pulled that opening the bowel out to make a little bit of a sleeve at the entrance that's actually to protect the skin I've just immediately around if they just sort of stitched it in like this with no with no sleeve gosh my left and right's really being played with with his camera um, you can imagine it would be really hard to get a bag that would fit snugly around that and you might get leakage into the skin so what they try and do is they try and create this bit of a cuff just excuse me for a second while I negotiate with my sock um, so they could try and create a bit of a suck and then what happens is you try and have the bag fitting around the outside of that sock, sock really snugged in um, nice and tight so we're trying to avoid getting any of the contents of the of the bowel any of that poo onto the skin because that can really irritate it and it, it actually really hurts like um it, it it can be really stingy it can be really itchy and it can end up being quite burnt so you can get ulcers and and really nasty weeping skin so we've got to protect that skin um now I'm going to introduce you to a member of a multidisciplinary team who I've not really introduced you to before and that is the stomal therapy nurse. Now most major hospitals have a stomal therapy nurse. Some hospitals don't um, and the, 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 uh, the services from that hospital and that nurse will vary from hospital to hospital and I guess the thing is if you're living on going with a stoma the, the the sort of like the the status that you leave the hospital on in it, it changes you know a lot of people have a stoma for years and years and years and so you might lose weight you might gain weight stomas usually start off being a bit swollen and big and they tend to shrink so what is an appropriate kind of bag situation for when you leave hospital with your new fresh stoma it probably won't be right for you in three months or in six months or in six years or in 16 years so um, it's really important to know that there are stomal therapy nurses available that might be you know might if it's been years since you went to that hospital that surgeon to have that stoma done it may be really difficult for you to reconnect with the stomal therapist who you might you know who might have fitted you with your original lot of bags um, but it's still very much possible to seek the advice of a stomal therapy nurse and I guess if you're struggling with that oh, I will put some resources and links in the notes but it's something that I'm really comfortable talking about with people on the phone too so if that's an issue for you I um, actually happen to know quite a bit about stomas so you know I'm certainly not a stomal therapy nurse but I can certainly point you in the right direction so um, skin care is actually really important one of the things that people with stomas sometimes get stuck um, on is uh, look um, the companies that make these products these bags this and there's lots and lots of skincare products look they're a business like any other business so you know if you're a week if you're a, um, a, a breakfast cereal brand then you're going to try and find any way of selling your breakfast cereal that you can there's very 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 strict rules about marketing of drugs to people with, you know who are who have a, um, a health concern so we we don't get ads well we still do get ads for things like Panadol but we don't get ads for things like chemotherapy or things like that but um, if you have a stoma and you signed up to your stoma association and you get the magazines and things they're, they're full of ads um, for the various lot of wipes or sprays or you know things like that so sometimes what can happen is you end up using lots of products on the skin around the stoma and they can make the whole thing worse because there's lots of things that you can have an allergy to so it's always good uh, you know less is more is often a good key and talk to your stomal therapy nurse before you sort of go to excuse me before you go too far down the track of using lots of wipes and creams and um, you know some creams aren't at all good for stomas because they stop bags from sticking so it's you've really got to have expert advice on that front it can be really useful you can get barrier wipes that help protect the skin around that opening you can get um, adhesive removal wipes which can be just make taking off the bag much more gentle um, and uh, so the, because the bag sticks to the skin so um, so there are things that products skincare products that can be really helpful but 
talk with a stoma therapy nurse before you leap too far down that rabbit hole because you could make things much more worse for yourself. Um, so, so, but skincare is really important, and it's, it's probably worth noting that there's um, there's closed systems. So sometimes people will wear a bag for the day, um, and there's no opening in that bag except the opening that the that the that the, the poo goes into from the from the bowel. Um, other people, and this is probably more likely if you've got bowel motions that are looser. So if you've got an ileostomy, or if you're a, pro, a person who's really prone to diarrhea with a colostomy, then there'll be an opening on the bag, so you can empty that into the toilet, clean the end of that bag, and then roll it back up again and seal it up to be able to still have it on. Because we don't want you to be unpeeling that sticky from your skin multiple times a day. Um, but yeah, the skincare is really important. I've talked about products. Something that is really important to note, um, um, I would really hope that anyone in Australia with a stroma would know this. Um, uh, and I know the arrangements in different countries are different. So if you're not watching, if you're watching from someone somewhere other than Australia, my apologies to you because I don't have details of the other funding schemes. But certainly in Australia, there is a, a fantastic reimbursement scheme and um, there's a small fee per year um, that you pay um, at the end of June and uh, that means that you you can be um, provided with all of the products that you need for your stroma throughout the year and um, that's amazing because these products are, are not cheap to manufacture um, and the government cover the cost of those products. Um, so that's really amazing but again if you've got a stoma and you didn't know about that I would really hope that no one's watching in that situation but I did want to mention it because sometimes I guess if you're looking down the barrel of that kind of surgery um, you might be thinking oh my goodness how am I going to manage financially with this situation so most um, so people with stomas um, will have access to that funding and often though so that those those um, the, the people who deliver the products or the or that you can go and pick the products from that's the stoma association and that's actually really common for a stoma association to have a stoma nurse um, present or as, as part of that service so um, you know there's there's one in Melbourne called the Melbourne Colostomy Association there's a stomal therapy nurse attached with that service that you can actually go and make an appointment with in the middle of Melbourne so if it was 16 years since your stomal surgery you don't necessarily have to go back to the hospital you could actually see that nurse um, at your stomal association um, so I've talked about emptying bags. Oh, so one of the things that can be really useful if you have a, a colostomy, so it's got to be a stoma that's much further down in the bowel. And for people with carcinoid syndrome, this will be less useful because if you get a lot of frequent diarrhea, you'll understand in a minute. But there is a, a way of managing that stoma called irrigation. And that is where you um, can instill some liquid up into the bowel and what they give you is like a cone um, I didn't get a cone I didn't, didn't have a cone thing I should have I could have made one with cardboard but I didn't so if you can imagine we've got our tummy with our stoma there we take the bag off and what they do is they actually connect a cone into the middle of the stoma with a bag attached and it's like an enema so you can have some fluid um, draining into the bowel and filling the bowel up and then what can what can what will then happen is that um, uh, the fluid comes back out with all of the the poo for you know in that length of bowel and what that can mean is that it can be then you know sometimes people will just need to irrigate once a day um, and instead of then needing to wear a full bag they might just be able to wear a small dressing over that stoma for the following you know 12 or 24 hours and and that does give freedom for some people. If they can, you know, that's that gives you a, a flatter profile under clothes. It can make it easier for things like swimming, um, uh, sex, that kind of stuff. So not everyone's able to irrigate. But if you're a person who's got a colostomy, and that colostomy is in a bit of a, a like you can't usually can't um, irrigate straight away when it's newly formed because the body takes ages to kind of work out its own pattern with it. But if you've had a colostomy for a while. And it's fairly regular, it's fairly, you know, so a lot of people with a colostomy will know that, you know, they'll have an active period in the morning and then it'll settle down throughout the day. Um, uh, so you might be a, a candidate for irrigation. So it's always worth asking about that. Sometimes people are sent home with a colostomy, um, they get a bag and they don't, you know, they might 
have a post-op check and everything's sort of going okay, but sometimes people don't find out about the irrigation potential. So not everyone can irrigate, but it's worth asking the question because it can actually make life a little bit more flexible if that's yourself, um, your situation. So I've talked a bit about irrigation, I've talked about reversal. One other practical aspect that I wanted to address is smell. So look, it's the thing that I think is the most common concern for people if they are told they need to have surgery to create a stoma is the the thought of you know socially will people be able to tell will people be able to smell and it's very very horrible to think that you're walking around smelling like someone's toilet um, it's extremely confronting and I, I know people who have had a stoma and it's really impaired their sense of self-confidence to the point where they they find it really difficult to leave the home and that's just so sad and I think the thing I want to say is that there are lots of strategies for managing that and most people with stomas we never know that they've got a stoma because we can't smell it and we can't see it and unless you tell us about it we would never know so there's things like um, VI poo spray um, that you can spray into the toilet before you empty your bag which means that if you're in a public toilet cubicle that can um, because often the matter from further up in up in the bowel, in the in the small bowel, that can have quite a aroma. Um, so using some VI poo or there's other little drops that you can get from the supermarket um, to drop into the toilet water that will actually um, help absorb that odor. Um, uh, but there's also deodorizers that you can actually like little drops that you can put inside the bag. Um, so if you're concerned about odour from the bag point of view, you can also do that. So there's some really fantastic strategies for managing odour. And for most people, we, we, can, we can get on top of that really easily. Um, so it's really important that you don't feel anxious about that, that actually we, we can help you connect, help connect you to the person who can help answer the question and provide a practical kind of solution for you to help you have the confidence to get out and live that full life. So... Um, sometimes people ask also if you can swim. I did mention swimming and irrigation, but you can absolutely swim with a bag. Um, now, sometimes, uh, well, bags, okay, so I didn't talk about wind. Maybe I'll talk about wind and then I'll talk about swimming. So um, we know that everybody farts. Um, it's a fact of life. And sometimes if you've got um, some fat malabsorption or um, that your digestion's a bit wonky, you've got carcinoid syndrome, we know um, somatostatin analogues are a bit renowned for making people windy. Um, so, but normally, again, we get a bit of a warning usually if we've got an intact bottom um, and we can maybe just subtly um, uh, cough at the same time or, um, or pop out of the room or if you've got very good muscle control, you might be able to manage a silent one. <laughs> but, but usually, f and fart sounds, you know, anyway. So what happens with a colostomy or an ileostomy is you still have that wind coming through and so a stoma will fart. Um, but you don't necessarily get any warning for it. So that can be really tricky because you might be in a very important meeting. You might be in a job interview or, um, you know, receiving communion or something really kind of quite serious and it sometimes will just go. Um, but the other thing is that, um, and so sometimes putting some pressure, if you know it's coming, some, sometimes putting some pressure on it will just sort of help dampen that noise but it is a thing um, and people learn variously humorous ways of managing that I think the, probably the most important thing about managing a stoma is developing a sense of humor and we've seen some very very beautiful humorous amazing posts in our in our group from people who um, are ostomates which is the the word for people who have a stoma so I guess if you if you're a, a neuroendocrine tumor um, patient who has a stoma you're a, a unicorn ostomate um, uh, so I was talking about farting. So bags will have a little air release valve with a filter. The filter's to prevent the smell coming out. Um, if you're swimming, we get, there's, a, there's stickers that come with bags and you put the sticker over the filter so you don't get, um, uh, that filter doesn't get wet because if it gets wet, um, it doesn't work any, so well anymore. So there's stickers that you put on the filter on the bag and you can absolutely swim. There's some actually some really great swimwear that has some... Uh, because sometimes you, that that sorry coming back to my practical example I use this more than I thought I was going to use it um, you can imagine that if you've got this is what your tummy would normally look like it'll be all smooth and if you've got this kind of 
arrangement with a, a stoma with a pat you know with a bit of a, a sleeve and you've got a bag on the front of your tummy um, it is there's a bit of contouring there and so you know it's there's some, it's worthwhile thinking about your swimwear for men they can um, you can actually buy swimming trunks with a like a, a pouch built into the swimming trunks to kind of contain the stoma bag and just stop it kind of getting swept around by the current so much. Um, uh, for women, you can also get um, just bathers with ruching or frills or um, patterns on the area, in the area so that it doesn't, you don't sort of notice the contour of the bag so much. That's worthwhile looking at. And actually, most people are not looking at your tummy. Um, most people are so worried about the way their own tummies work <laughs> or look that, that they're not even noticing um, the way our tummies look. So, but it's much easier for me to say that than for you to believe it. So, you know, it's worthwhile having a look around and choosing some swimwear with some um, some ruching or some patterns or some, you know, a little skirt or, um, you know, that sort of thing just to kind of um, disguise it a little bit if, you, if you're feeling self-conscious. Um, so, uh, that's that's where I'm going to leave all of that. I want to talk just a bit about diet. So I talked before about the roles of the bowel and the implications if you've got a colostomy or an ileostomy further up in the bowel and that you might not be particularly absorbing the food um, and the fluid. So what can happen is if your, if your colostomy or your ileostomy is further up in the bowel, we can have problems with dehydration because the um, what's in the bowel hasn't got enough time to sit in the large bowel before it remove you know before it exits the body and so we can have problems with dehydration and electrolyte imbalance so if you are losing a lot of liquid through your stoma it's worthwhile keeping a really close eye on that a really great way of knowing if you're dehydrated is if your wee turns darker it should be like a really pale yellow color like almost the color of my wall behind me um, if, if, you, if it's sort of darker like you know lemon juice or or even orange juice sometimes that that means you're dehydrated and you need to up your fluid and it's probably worthwhile doing some electrolyte um, replacement as well so using something like the hydrolyte that they give people if they've got gastro don't use commercial um, rehydration sports drinks they're often loaded with sugar and not good for you so um, um, yeah one person's just commented saying they have over two liters daily so that's a lot of fluid that you've got to then try and drink to, to make up for that so that's and that's going to be really challenging for your body's electrolyte system so um, there are some strategies for thickening up um, the output from a stoma and uh, the person who's commented you might be all over this already but I'll put some links in the notes just in case there's things in there that you haven't seen that might be useful because yeah, as I said there are some things we can do to help thicken that up again um, just to make it practically easier so I don't get the poo explosion so much but um, but also from a body well-being point of view just trying to absorb that that liquid um, uh, so not only can you get diarrhea from a stoma, you can also get constipation from a stoma and that is really tricky. So um, we want to manage things either way and some drugs can cause constipation. So if you have a stoma and um, you, you prescribed a drug that might cause constipation, it's worthwhile paying special attention to that because it can be really difficult to manage. Because unlike a you know, we don't want anyone to be straining on the toilet, but um, if you're a bit constipated and you've got a normal bowel opening on your bottom, you've got the muscles that can assist to evacuate your bowel, whereas a stoma you don't. So that can be really quite nasty and people can end up in hospital because they're constipated. Um, uh, I've talked a bit about wind, I've talked about constipation, diarrhea. So the other thing that um, for an ileostomy, so when a stoma is further up in the bowel, we can, because that sock the ileostomy the ilium is not anywhere near this kind of diameter it's a really much smaller diameter tube and when we create a stoma with the small bowel you can be prone to bowel obstruction and what bowel obstruction is it is what it sounds like it's when something has blocked the lumen the the in the tunnel inside the the bowel and the contents can't get through and you get like what happens when you get a, a train stuck at a train station and everything further back up the line so it's got to wait. So that's, that bowel obstruction can be really nasty. It can be 
um, very medically serious because that's got to get through um, and you're not going to be able to eat or drink any food or fluid often people will start um, getting uh, vomit you know they'll vomit they'll become dehydrated it's very very painful so um, if you've got a, a stoma further up in the bowel like an ileostomy there are some specific dietary requirements for you now for anyone who's had any sort of bowel surgery there'll be a period of adjustment where you work out what your body is going to be okay to do and as your body heals that'll usually loosen um that become more flexible so but uh, people with um ileostomies are usually um, advised to avoid really high fiber foods really high gas producing foods um foods like nuts and seeds that could get stuck in that really small tube um, and, and sometimes foods with the peel, like things like tomatoes with the peel on, can be problematic too. So if, you, if you've got an ileostomy, hopefully that is something that you would be educated on. But it's worth, I'll, I'll make sure I put some links in about that as well. If you've got a colostomy, it's a lot more flexible usually. But everybody's different and everybody responds differently to diet and surgery and everything. So um, it's, it's sometimes it's a bit of a trial and error. Um, and so I've certainly talked to heaps of people with a colostomy when nuts are still, oh, they're just not good. Um, or, you know, sometimes sweet corn can be not good. So because of the fiber and the, num you know, the lots of little bits of skin that will come through. Um, so it's a matter of kind of getting to know thyself as well as following the advice that you've been given. Um, so I just wanted to talk a bit more about kind of life with the stoma. And there's two things. There's, I wanted to talk about exercise. Well, three, maybe exercise. I wanted to talk very briefly about sex. And I also wanted to talk about emotions because this has all been very practical and, you know, Kate Wakeland meets, meets play school with the sock and the, um, and, the, and the salmon container, but this is a pretty major thing to have on your body. Um, so let's talk about exercise first and we'll get through to the emotions. Um, a lot of people think that they can't exercise when they have a stoma and that's actually not true at all. Having said that, when you can imagine that this is... Obviously there's skin here, but underneath the skin is a layer of muscle. And if we create a big, you know, a reasonably so, they're not this big, but a reasonable size opening in that muscle wall of the tummy, that's actually a really sort of quite strong body of muscle that helps us stay upright. Um, if we put a reasonable size hole in that, it can be like putting a hole in a pair of stockings. So what can happen is if you do something that creates lots of muscle strain, like lifting a heavy weight, and especially in those initial first few months after your surgery, what can happen is you can get a little tear in the muscle leading away from that stoma. And it's just because the muscle's kind of pulled that way and it's just sort of given a bit of a tear here or a tear here. So, And what happens then is that it allows the, the bowel and the, and the muscle underneath it to kind of get pushed get pushed out through the bigger hole so you know what that might be a normal size stoma what can happen with a hernia is that that stoma gets bigger but you also get a bulge on the surface surface of the skin and it can actually be really quite painful um, they can be repaired surgically but it is complicated because usually repairing a hernia from a stoma means they means they need to change the position of the stoma most people only have two sides of their abdomen so you and and once you've had one hernia you sort of at risk of getting another one so the prevention's much better than cure so there's a couple of things you can do to prevent it firstly go very very easy those first few weeks and months after your operation no heavy weight lifting no planking please no sit-ups certainly there'll be some abdominal exercises that you can do but be be advised by your healthcare team but please don't go gung-ho about it because you could live to regret it um, there's also support garments that some people find really useful not everybody does um, there's various schools of thought about whether they're good or not and and certainly the companies that produce them that make them will sell the plants off them and make them sound like they're the best thing since sliced bread but not everybody needs them so again talk with your stomal therapy nurse about that you may not need to get special underwear or special support garments um, it's very individual um, so, but exercise is really important for us, especially if you've had cancer. And maybe I'll link to our exercise video 
um, in the notes as well. The other thing that's really important for us is sex and this is probably related to the emotional side of things but it's actually also you know um, related to the practical side of things if you're living with a stoma um, you'll know that there's some practical things that need to be really sorted out if you're feeling romantic um, so there are some practical tips like um, you know if, if you know that you've got a lovely night planned ahead with a, a potential partner um, it might be that you sort of ease up on the foods that you know will give you high output in the hours preceding um, it might be emptying, you know, just making sure that your bag's empty and fresh. Sometimes you can actually get um, actually really quite lovely. Um, it's not like a, it's not a support garment, but it's actually a band that goes around the tummy and um, just to visually hide the, the bag, but also prevent the bag from kind of flopping around while you're having your, your lovely time together. And, um, uh, uh, you know, someone used the, the expression snap, crackle, pop, which was just... Um, pretty disturbing so so sometimes having some um, and and so there are un underwear stomal underwear companies that will actually just sell a band um, that goes around your tummy and that can be really quite good um, you can get lace ones you can get just plain you know, flesh colored ones um, it can take a while when you've had look at any sort of surgery or you know thing that's created a change in your body it can take a while to get your head around that and to recover your sense of self-confidence and self-esteem and you know people have worries about things like smells they have worries about things like well what if I have a leak during an intimate um, encounter with someone what about dating someone new how do I introduce this topic to people by and large people are actually fine with it but it's all very well for me to say that it's reasonable for this to take a while and for this to feel big I think that's normal and that's important for you to just acknowledge this is normal I'm feeling you know really quite wound up and, and emotional and worried and and you're grieving your body image because it is a major change um, so it's okay to take your time to move through those emotions and maybe it's worthwhile seeing someone to help process those so I'm talking maybe a psychologist or um, you know a healthcare a mental health practitioner to help you work through the grief of that big body change because you know I don't want to be too blunt about it but mostly we don't get to witness our waste products exiting our body because our bottom is behind us you know we don't see that we sit on a neat usually we sit on a neat toilet we're not even squatting like we sit on a very neat toilet it's very sanitized there's air fresheners everywhere lots of beautiful toilet paper you know we come out we've flushed we've washed our hands and it's all very sanitized and look a lot of people haven't really you know I guess we get used to wiping our bums but we do get used to that don't we so just like I guess wiping your bum you will get used to having a stoma um, but it is big and it's really reasonable that that feels big and then it takes some time to get your head around so be gentle with yourself you know when you're going through something that's big emotionally that's causing grief that you have to adjust to that's you know reducing yourself a sense of self-esteem and self-confidence you have to be gentle with yourself and give yourself some time to make that adjustment and you will just like when you adjust to a new grief a new thing um, human beings are incredibly resilient but it can take some time so just be gentle with yourself about that so I think that's where I'll leave it there's so much that you know obviously people will stomach study stomas for um, you know a long long time and still be learning when they're a stomal therapy nurse I'm gonna leave it there because I've been talking at you for ages um, but look give me a ring if this is you um, I'm really happy to talk about this stuff you know me I'm always happy. there's nothing off the table for me whether it's sex whether it's stomas whether it's death whether it's whatever just give me a ring or send me actually send me an email is easier if that's okay just because um, uh, that means that I can kind of work out what the nature of your inquiry is and we can make a time for me to, you know if I need to ring you then I can make a time so my contact details will be in the notes as well so I'll, I'll leave it there now there's only one piece of news for you this week because um, uh, we've had some support groups actually that's been really exciting we've had some face-to-face -face support groups which is just wonderful 
in the um, moving through and out of COVID um, world. So if you were one of those people who managed to get along to a face-to-face -face meeting, then um, we certainly had our, la our last meeting in Melbourne last week was via Zoom. So um, we showed resilience and forbearance and tolerance about that and just got on with it and we still had a lovely time. But yeah, if you got to go to a face-to-face -to -face meeting, I'm a little bit jealous, but you will get there. Um, so there's only one piece of news and that is about our health professionals e-learning course. So we've been calling, I've been calling that the GP course and it, that's been my error because it's actually not just for GPs. It's really for any health professional who has an APRA registration number. So that's doctors, that's nurses, that's actually people like um, uh, other registered health profession professionals as well. So we, it was, we certainly started off with the aim of educating GPs and we're really excited because I can't remember the numbers, but we've got some stats and we've got heaps of GPs who have already completed the course. So, And that's thanks to our community because we know that you have taken the flyer and given it to your GP and said, you need to learn about my disease and credit to the GPs is, is that they have done it. So if you're one of those people who've given a flyer to your GP, maybe next time you go, ask them if they've finished the course, ask them if they've signed up, I'll make sure the details are in the notes. Because the exciting news is that we've just received news that we are getting accredited through the Australian College of Nursing for nurses to do this course. Um, now, nurses have always been able to do the course, but they weren't always accredited to the, do the course. And what that meant, what the accreditation means is that it, it gives them um, a, a certificate um, so of, of completion so that they can use that as, a, as evidence for their continual professional development requirements. So every registered nurse in Australia needs to do at least 20 hours a year of courses of education and that sort of thing. And this course gives you 10 of those 20 hours in a year. So it's half of a nurse's professional development requirement. And look, a lot of nurses actually have to self-fund those courses and, and courses and conferences can cost hundreds of dollars for nurses. So this is free. So if you've got a nurse in your life, if you've got an eShine nurse, if you've got a Ipsen Assist nurse, if you've got a GP nurse, if you've got a relative who's a nurse and they've got an APRA number, um, I'll make sure I put the details for the course in the notes because I'm so excited. I really, we really want to spread the word so that more and more health professionals out there in the land of Australia and beyond can um, can learn more about nets and get that really great understanding of you know so that they can look after you better and provide you with better care. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. It is lovely to see you all. Thank you so much to everyone who, who logged in at the in live time. I know Friday lunchtime is not always the best time to um, to to watch something. And, and also I was talking about something that wasn't really kind of mealtime conversation matter. I do apologise for that. But I hope it wasn't too disturbing. Um, let me know if you were having lunch and watching it at the same time. I think bravo to you if that's the case. Um, I will look forward to seeing you next week. Now, next week, I'm going to come to a t another topic that I've been promising to do for ages and I haven't had a chance. But next week, we're going to talk about anxiety. So a few weeks ago, a few months ago, we talked about depression and that's a really important one. But this coming week, we're going to talk about anxiety on Friday. So I'm looking forward to um, doing a bit of homework on that. So we're all, you know, I've got all my kind of knowledge ducks in a row. Um, I've got lots to share with you about that, including some really practical tips and strategies for managing anxiety with NETS. So I'm looking forward to that one. I will see you then if you manage to log in and have a great weekend. Thank you everybody for saying hi and sticking with me. Take care everyone.